Our topic now is uh, flower angiosperm. Remember that angiosperms are flowering plants. Reproduction. So uh, just a couple examples. A uh, parasitic plant uh, produces huge flowers that produce up to 4 million seeds. Many angiosperms, re this is just information, reproduce sexually and asexually, and we'll come back to that a little bit. And then the last part is about breeding plants. Okay, a little bit of biotechnology. So let's talk about uh, the first thing that happens is that we have uh, pollination. Okay, pollination. Now, in angiosperms, the sporophyte is the dominant generation. Remember, alternation of generations in plants. Some plants, the gametophyte. In the case of angiosperms, gametophytes are reduced. What are the gametophytes? Pollen grains, those are haploid, and embryo sacs, the female gametophyte, or ovule, develop within flowers. Okay, so the, the parts, those two are going to get together, if you will, and make a sporophyte or a diploid plant. A quick review of flower parts. I would memorize this uh, thing, and if we get a chance later on this year when we get some flowers, we will uh, look. We'll dissect a flower. The male part. I always remember male because of men. The stamen with the anther and the filament. The female part called the carpal, or a lot of times called the pistil. The stigma style and ovary. Here. Okay, now the next slide is going to be a diagram that I would memorize if I were you. It's reproduction of a flower. And I'm going to take you through it a little bit. If a flower wants to reproduce itself, pollen grains fall onto the stigma of the female part. Okay, pollen is produced by the male part of the plant, the anther. Now a cool thing happens in that the pollen will stay here, but it will grow a tube down, it grows a tube, down into the down the style and to the ovary where sperm is deposited now it's not sperm like you think of sperm with humans but the same idea and inside this is simplified most plants have more than one egg okay if you think of a bean for example a bean has what five or six seeds in it that would be five or six eggs so now that the sperm fertilizes the egg and makes a zygote inside of the seed. Okay, and in this case, the zygote becomes part of a fruit. The ovary becomes a fruit. Inside of the fruit is the growing baby plant. The seed, the seed is deposited in the ground, germinates, and grows another flower. Simplified life cycle of an angiosperm. Now we're going to look at that in a little bit of detail. Interestingly enough, many plants can't self-fertilize, okay? Uh, the most common is what's called self-incompatibility, the fact that a plant can reject its own pollen as foreign, okay? We don't really know why. That's what that line's about. We really don't know why that happens. The second kind is you could be uh, a plant like this, where uh, in two different varieties of uh, I think this is violet, but I'm not sure. It might be an orchid. Sometimes the stigmas are far below the style. I'm sorry, the anthers are far below the stigma. So pollen can't just fall onto the stigma. A bee would have to come in here, collect pollen, and fly off with it. Okay? In a thrum kind of flower, these can self-fertilize. There's also sometimes um, plants produce pollen at different times of year. The times they produce pollen are different. So they produce pollen at, uh, in, uh, uh, let's say, in May, and the style is ready for the pollen in June. That's a little bit of exaggeration, but pollen will produce at a different time of year than when this plant is able to take it. Okay? So there's a number of ways plants can prevent self-fertilization. After fertilization, important idea, ovules develop into seeds and ovaries into fruits. The ovule is inside of the ovary, and let me show you this, okay? 
<coughs> the second important concept is that of double fertilization. Pollen grain produces a pollen tube. We've already talked about that. The pollen tube then discharges two sperm for each ovule. Two sperm per ovule. Okay, so if a, if a plant has eight ovules, that would be 16 sperm. One sperm fertilizes the egg, and the other combines with what's called the polar nuclei, giving rise to the food-storing endosperm, and I'll come back to that. So here's a picture showing double fertilization. Pollen tube grows down. Two uh, seeds, are, two sperm are produced. One sperm fertilizes the egg, and the other sperm fertilizes, uh, forming a triploid, what's called endosperm, which is the food inside of the seed. So another view, this is simplified, this is only one ovule, okay? This one ovule starts to grow the little baby plant inside, and the stuff around it is food for the growing embryo, and we'll take a closer look at this with our plant growing contest, actually. Okay, and now here's a peanut or a bean, which is a dicot. Dicot has two cotyledons. Those cotyledons are full of endosperm. That endosperm is going to feed this plant, this baby plant, as it grows. Here's a monocot. One cotyledon, but again, baby plant, endosperm. A fruit develops from the ovary. The fruit is for protection for the seeds and to help disperse the seeds. And we're not going to have to know the different kinds of fruits, but I'm going to run these by you a minute. Simple fruits, aggregate fruits, and multiple fruits. A pea is a simple fruit. Okay? Here's the fruit. Here's all the seeds growing inside. This was down in here. Here were all the egg ovules. That now became seeds. And aggregate fruit, like a raspberry, there were many individual uh, carpels, which would be pistils in here. A raspberry flower, if you look at it, it doesn't have one pistil, it has a many. And so each one of those pistils becomes a fruit. A pineapple is a multiple fruit where there were many flowers. This isn't, we call this the pineapple flower, but actually has many individual flowers, each of which become their own fruit. So then the seed has to germinate. As the seed grows, it dehydrates and becomes dormant. So seeds can last years. They can be years before, they're, before they grow. And so the reason to do this, of course, is to increase the chances that germination will occur at a time and a place most advantageous. That makes sense. If a plant produces a seed during a very dry period, okay, during, the, during a very dry period, it's going to fall on the ground and not grow, so it can stay there until the conditions are right. Sometimes it's environmental cues, temperature or lighting. Okay, generally, you have to have water, okay, and what happens here, this shows, this is a good slide showing what happens to a plant. Maybe you've seen this before if you've planted a plant. Where does the plant get the energy to produce this root structure and to grow through the ground? Well, the energy is coming from the endosperm. That's the food for the growing plant. Here's a corn growth. Same idea. So many uh, angiosperms can reproduce asexually or vegetatively reproduce. Okay, we've already talked about sexual reproduction. I don't think we need to go through that anymore. Uh, a plant can fragment where many of its parts can be, you can cut up its parts and scatter it and they develop into whole plants. Okay? In some species, a parent plant's root system gives rise to adventitious shoots that become separate shoot systems. For example, I have in my uh, uh, garden a forsythia plant. 
A forsythia is a shrub. Grows pretty tall, has lots of branches like this. It's yellow in the spring. Well, some of its branches droop to the ground. And when they do, they grow underground and then, boop, spring up as a new plant. So I have to be cutting that all the time because this will grow its own roots. So if you don't want multiple forsythias, these branches all droop anyway, you have to keep cutting those off or else they'll grow and develop a new one. So we have taken, and uh, some people make a living, from asexually propagating or making more angiosperms. Okay, we can do things like cloning them from cuttings. We can take cuttings off of plant fragments and making different ones. We can graft. Uh, Mrs. Van Timmeren does this. She takes a twig off one tree, cuts off the bark, and grafts the twig on another. This We do this a lot with apples. Apples. Many of the apple trees you see are grafted. If you have Mr. Bollinger's class, he does a little test tube cloning. Okay, He does test tube cloning of take a few parenchyma cells from a carrot, it's called a callus, and then grow a new carrot plant inside of in kind of an auger medium here. So we've done a lot of stuff with plant biotechnology, uh, genetically modified plants. Okay, and a lot of people freak out about this, but we've been genetically modifying plants for years by using uh, hybridization. Okay, an example, here's a good example of that. This is maize. This grows in the wild. This is what we've done with it over the years. We made sweet corn out of maize. Okay, maize grows naturally, sweet corn does not, but through the right techniques of genetic engineering and breeding, we now have sweet corn. So, we've done what we've done then is we've genetically modified plants to increase the quality and quantity of food. If you, the wheat we have growing now and the different things we have that have grown so much food in such a little area. Okay, basically the plains of Midwest America feed the world. And of course we've made progress in developing transgenic plants to tolerate herbicides. So we can put herbicides on the field to get rid of the, the weeds and still have plants uh, that will grow. So that's a quick overview of angiosperm reproduction and then, of course, uh, some biotechnology stuff.